Hello, I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about trigeminal nerve stimulation and ADHD. So I'll be talking for about 20 minutes. If you have questions, you can type them in. This will be posted both on YouTube and Facebook later. And I've been told that I should try to talk both louder and faster, so I'll try to do so. So the takeaway message is that there is a FDA-approved external trigeminal nerve stimulation machine, device, that has been shown in two small studies to be effective for treating kids with ADHD. Um, it was approved two years ago, and the studies looked encouraging, and so far it doesn't seem to have reached widespread use or approval, and I'll get into community-wide approval or acceptance. Um, I'll get into that. So clarifications and disclosures. I have no connection to NeuroSigma, which is the UCLA-based company and that produces this device called the Monarch device. Um, other confusing things to get out in front. So this is off, trigeminal nerve stimulation is often abbreviated TNS, and that's not to be confused with TMS, which is transcranial magnetic stimulation, of which there are six or seven devices now that the FDA has approved for treating depression, and it's being looked at in a number of other uses, including ADHD, and one of our previous talks was on that. So, so what does this device, what's involved with this device? So the device is invo involves a patch on the forehead. It's about a three by five card size patch that gets affixed to the forehead. It's an electrical conducting patch that's attached to wires that um, are fixed to or coming from a little box about the size of your cell phone. This battery powered box is providing pulse, pulse um, low voltage electrical current all night to the person's head. And so far it's only been children this has been studied in. The treatment's designed to be lasting eight hours at least or all night long. And it did seem to take several weeks um, to see results for ADHD. So, so a little bit more. So the concept, what they think they're doing is stimulating the trigeminal nerve um, by, with this electrical current on the forehead. So the trigeminal nerve is one of the 12, 12 cranial nerves, paired nerves that exit the holes in her head. So there are little holes in her head to allow these nerves to do their business, to bring in information and from the outside of your skull into your brain and to send messages from your skull outside of the brain. The trigeminal nerve is considered the most complicated of the 12 cranial nerves. It's cranial nerve number five. And it's primarily, and this is a short version, provides sensation all over your face, back into your brain. And it sends sig and signals from the brain to the chewing muscles, the big motor muscles of your mouth. So it is not to be confused with facial nerve number seven, um, which is involved with the many of the other facial muscles of the muscles of the face, particularly facial expression. So doing thing, weird things with your face is not the trigeminal nerve. That's just the big chewing muscles. And as such, so, so the thought is that this process, this device is stimulating that nerve specifically. That nerve is carrying information back into the brain um, through both PET studies and less directly through EEG studies. We know that this device seems that device activates deeper you know, structures within the brain, including the anterior cingulate cortex that seems to have effects on decreasing activity in the motor cortex and the temporal parietal zone of the brain. And one of the leading thoughts is that primarily it's helping with ADHD through activating the right frontal part of the brain, which we know is important and some studies of ADHD, depending on task and situation, suggest widespread lower levels of activity in this part of the brain. So there's a plausible, although not completely mapped out, um, mechanism why this may be helpful for ADHD. A couple things. So this is actually most similar to vagus nerve stimulation, which we haven't talked about here. That's a, so the vagus nerve is another 
one of our cranial nerves, so exits through tiny holes in the brain and goes primarily down towards our digestive system. There are FDA approved devices to stimulate the vagus nerve to treat depression. And again, so that's clearly not what we were talking about in one of the recent talks where we're either using transcranial magnetic, a big powerful magnets to directly influence brain tissue and it's not the lower level, low current direct transcranial direct stimulation, which also we think is directly stimulating the brain. These are again, two different, tapping into two different nerves, which feed back into the brain and again are providing theoretically more specific activation to certain centers in the brain, thereby helping with um, neurologic and psychiatric conditions. Um, so the studies that were done, so, so the studies are encouraging, but they have some big weaknesses. So the studies involved using both a sham treatment, so kids didn't know whether they had a real device hooked up to their brain, or my parents didn't know either, or the actual Monarch device. Um, so that's good, it was a double blind study. Again, the, a simple ADHD rating scale was used to evaluate at the end of four weeks whether kids improved or not. And the treatment group decreased score was about nine points versus only about a six point decrease in the control placebo group. That was a statistically and probably a clinically significant difference in the two groups. And about 75% of the kids in the treatment group did respond. And in addition to the the more general global ADHD rating scale, there were more specific um, executive function and other sort of neurophysiologic tests looked at and on measures of, you know, there was decreased impulsivity, other measures that seemed to track with ADHD functioning seemed to improve with this treatment. Um, a positive of this treatment was that it was very well tolerated, even though you have a patch slapped to your head all night. Um, so there were some kids who reported drowsiness, some increased appetite, some with insomnia, some with headaches. None of these seemed to particularly differ from the rates of problems in the control groups. Nobody had to end the study early because side effects were problematic. Um, and the second study this group did showed that there, they could isolate at least two predictive values of, or markers of who was gonna to respond to this treatment. So one predictive marker was actually having lower scores on executive function tests to begin with. So kids who were presumably more impaired in the real world had a better response or more clear cut response to this than less severely executively function impaired children. And the other thing that was a predictor was looking within the first few days of who had increased right frontal EEG activity as measured by EEG power or activity brain brain activation early on, those kids were more likely to respond to the treatment at the end of the four week trial. So sort of getting back to the safety or other issues. So this Monarch device um, was approved as long ago as 2012 in the EU, European Union, for treating both epilepsy and depression. And again, it's thought that it's working the same way, that stimulating the trigeminal nerve is going back, activating certain brain structures that could either help with decreasing epilepsy or improving the symptoms of depression. Um, the European Union also approved this device in 2015 for treating ADHD. It was two years late, or four years later, April of 2019, that the FDA approved this device in America. Um, for treating ADHD in kids seven to 12 years old. And the other caveat was, this was in kids who were not currently on any medication. So there are not any formal studies looking at this simultaneously with either stimulant or non-stimulant medication. Um, the really important thing to remember, and we touched on this with the um, other devices, used to neuromodulator affect the brain is that FDA approval of a device is much less rigorous than approval for a medication. 
So the FDA criteria for approving a device is simply the FDA's assessment that this device is, if used as instructed, is more likely to be beneficial than to cause harm. That's it. Um, so you don't have to do stage one, stage two, stage three trials. You don't have to show how normal people respond to it. Um, it's a much curtailed device, so it, and it's not really an endorsement saying the FDA has determined this definitely works with ADHD. They're just saying, yeah, the benefits seem to outweigh the risks. And in this device, again, the risks seem pretty low and trivial so far. Um, so why isn't this being more widely used? So one thing, although the studies seem to be generally well devised, there are only essentially two published studies. Um, there's, there's a third study, but it was a preliminary result of the first big study that got approved. Less than 100 kids. So in the two different studies, it's 86 kids combined have been studied. No adults have been looked at. Nobody's on medications at the same time. Um, the studies only lasting for four weeks, although the recommendation is that you should keep using this device for months or years. Um, so those are all blockages in terms of seeing whether this is really helpful in a broader population. I'd say one other weakness is that the group that published these studies is the group that developed and is marketing and profiting from the Monarch device, NeuroSigma's device. Um, it, it's a reputable group at UCLA Medical Center um, that's involved in this. One other reason um, that probably this hasn't taken off more widely is that when bringing devices like this, particularly a new one to the market, there's different marketing strategies. One marketing strategy is let's make something really inexpensive, make it as available to as many people as possible, and make our profit dependent on lots and lots of number of sales, you know, smaller profit per unit. And then the other approach, which lots of the medical field seems to support, largely because people are willing to pay lots of money for approaches, including medications that really work, or insurance companies have been in the past, is to charge a lot and not worry if you're use, you know, selling lots of product, you are making a lot of product cost after each one. Again, I am not privy to what they're really thinking. I don't know the actual costs, but the electronics seem incredibly simplistic and much less than... So the cost of this device is $980. Again, they did get FDA approval, which means you need a doctor's prescription to um, get this device. There are groups at UCLA and I think at two other medical centers and. Washington DC and Houston, I believe, who are, you know, part of NeuroSigma's designated, you know, help promote this device, but any doctor could write for it. But again, the, and NeuroSigma does provide a form, so if you want your doctor to write for it, there's a pre-made form to do that. But $980, and at this point, it's not clear if any insurers have covered the cost. Um, and not only is it $980 a day, they, they give you, and I mentioned part of the system is this patch that goes right on your forehead. Um, those patches are designed to only be used once and thrown away. They give you a four week supply with the original device, but then they charge essentially 70 bucks for a seven pack of the patches, which comes out to 10 bucks a day that you're adding onto the close to $1,000 Price of the original. If this works well, and again, the preliminary su evidence suggests in some people it may well work well, then that cost may be less certainly than brand name medications every day, but it's a fairly steep cost and um, there may well be other companies that come with competing devices that may be a more affordable price, which may help dissemination of this product. Other worries or concerns in this, so one 
set of critics have said, you know, this is using electrical stimulation right on the forehead. And although you're claiming, and I, I would say the studies do seem to indicate that we are triggering, stimulating the trigeminal nerve, and that is going back and stimulating brain structures, maybe what you're really just doing is a, is a transcranial direct electrical stimulation because the por frontal cortexes are right there in the back of that bone that you're slapping right in the back of your forehead. To me, a, a convincing response to that is again that, that the PET scan and the EEG studies show preferential activation of the right frontal cortex, and you think that if you're slapping this device right in the center of your forehead, and if what it was really doing was directly transcranial stimulation, then you should, one would expect, at least um, parallel, equal, stimulate, symmetrical, is the word I'm looking for, symmetrical stimulation or maybe symmetrical depression of both frontal hemispheres, and you don't. So the fact that you're seeing preferential activation in the right frontal area when you are slapping a device here is pretty convincing that it's not a direct effect, that you're seeing the effect of stimulating the trigeminal nerve and not going back and feeding into the brain. There are other critics of this device. Um, Peter Bregan is one of the leaders of this, and Peter Bregan's a psychiatrist who is virulently against medications and any physical devices, including ECT, to treat psychiatric conditions. And his claim is that any device that could be changing or alterating, altering neural activity in kids is causing brain damage, not helping kids. I don't agree philosophically. That point doesn't make much sense because we know even talking therapies like CBT for depression or CBT for panic disorder do result in neuromodulation or changes in the brain. And why you would say, well, if you did it through CBT, that's a good change. And if you did it through medication or electrical stimulation, that's inherently a bad change. That just doesn't philosophically or factually seem to make much sense to me. So I won't go further into that criticism. Um, so again, I, I've checked Reddit threads and others. I, I can't, I have not had any interactions with patients who've had direct use with this device. I haven't found online many people who are talking about it. It just has not taken off yet. Maybe because it's doing something differently than anything else is doing, messing with the trigeminal nerve this way. Although again, the device has been approved for almost a decade now for treating epilepsy and depression in the EU. So I'm not seeing any questions coming up right now. Last week, for some reason, the questions didn't tally right away. The topic for next week is going to be a little more clinically oriented rather than sort of technical. So it's going to be talking about perfectionism in ADHD and how to deal with it, work with it, or overcome it. So have a perfectly good week, um, a stimulating week, and I will be back next Friday at 11. S stay well, stay safe. Bye for now.